I sometimes think about the way that these birds by the lake perceive me. They don't seem to be afraid, but other than that, I ponder whether or not they wonder where I came from, or if they even care, so long as I'm feeding them and not making any sudden movements. Of course, these ducks are used to people, but if they weren't, I'm sure that they would be intimidated by my size, or maybe if they saw me get out of a car, they would be very weary of human technology. I often have these types of thoughts, especially in regards to aliens and what it would be like if humanity were confronted with another race from the stars, assuming it hasn't happened already. As an anthropologist, I'm interested in understanding mankind, in how civilizations developed and how religions came to be. With modern advances in the field of genetics, great progress has been made in understanding why there are different races, and it turns out that things did not unfold the way that it's been portrayed in the media, which seems to be more about promoting an egalitarian political agenda than with unbiased scientific discovery. Organizations such as the Smithsonian and even the United Nations have promoted the theory of a linear progression of mutating simians that left Africa that then populated places like Europe. Cro-Magnon, the first fully modern hominin, first shows up all of a sudden in the fossil and genetic record about 40,000 years ago. Before that date, there is no hominin on the planet that has a chin, which in an anthropological context is a signature of an agricultural diet. Cro-Magnon's blood type was A negative, and A blood type is considered to have come from an agricultural population. That said, no other hominin, primate, or prosimian had Rh negative blood. Incidentally, simian basically means monkey, and pro means before. So what I'm saying is, no monkey, ape, or other hominin such as Neanderthal, Homo erectus, or anything that supposedly evolved into monkeys was Rh negative. Nothing before Cro-Magnon used bow and arrows, or used spears, or any bifacial tool technology. And to top it off, Cro-Magnon was taller and had a significantly larger cranial capacity than today's average. So the Darwinian model is not only inadequate and obsolete, it seems to me that the ancient myths and legends are a more realistic explanation for what happened during the late Pleistocene or Ice Age than the out of Africa model, which is looking more and more like a really bizarre fairy tale. In my book, Species with Amnesia, I identify Cro-Magnon as a likely candidate for what civilizations like the ancient Egyptians, Greeks, and Basque call an Atlantean. During the first half of the 20th century, the nationalist German government sent expeditions around the world exploring the remnant civilizations and descendants of Cro-Magnon, such as the Guanches, the native people of the Canary Islands in the Atlantic, which left tall mummies and built small stone pyramids. While this research was shunned by the British, who won World War II, during the first half of the 20th century, the British Museum instead displayed the Piltdown Man, a scientific fraud of an orangutan or baboon's jaw glued onto a human skull, filling the academic textbooks with lies and Eurocentric propaganda about a missing link found in England. It seems the concept of an ancient, advanced civilization which was decimated by cataclysms, but not before interacting with other primitive races around the world, is a much more credible scenario, even if it's not considered politically correct and fails to fit into the modern globalist political agenda. In my research, it seems the farther one looks back in time, the more advanced and impressive the architecture is, such as the massive megalithic constructions in modern Lebanon at sites like Baalbek, where each stone block weighs over 800 tons, much more massive than anything achieved by the Roman civilization who also occupied the area and attempted construction there many millennia later. 
The same examples can be seen in places like Peru, where the pre-Incan civilizations produced a superior megalithic construction than the more modern civilizations that came after, which strikes me as counterintuitive if one were to adhere to the Darwinian model. According to the myths and legends, an advanced seafaring civilization established colonies around the world and even mated with and interbred with the various other types of hominins they encountered, which seems to be reflected in the genetic evidence that is currently being taught in universities. Yet ironically, one rarely sees mention of this on any mainstream media outlet or even in any movies. During our own age, the Holocene, we have first-hand examples documented of when a more advanced agricultural civilization encounters for the first time a hunter-gatherer tribe illustrating the cultural differences and going against the narrative that agriculture developed spontaneously at the same time around the world, rather than the diffusionist model, which means one group spread it around, uh, becoming the nobility, or in some cases, deified as gods. In the following clip, a native Wang Ku Jonka woman who lives at Christmas Creek in Western Australia has seen many changes throughout her lifetime, but nothing so dramatic when as a teenager she saw a white man for the first time. I was born among the sand hills in my own country. There were no white people. We slept without blankets. All we had was a fire to keep us warm. My mother had been making me chili, but now we had a blanket and nappy, nothing. Yeah. Now under bed. We wore no clothes, completely naked. Baby, nappy, nothing. Be a naked. You are. We used to travel around and go hunting on foot. We'd catch large guanas, bandicoots, blue tongue lizards and possums. We'd eat every bit of these animals, even crush the bones and eat them too. My father and mother would both go hunting. My sister and I would stay near the camp and hunt for small lizards. We'd track thorny devils following its tiny tracks until we could find one feasting on ants. We would catch it and look around for more. Then we would cook and eat them and save some for our mother and father. The first time I saw an aeroplane was down near the stock route. It landed near us. We thought the white people might kill us. We were frightened of the white people. So we hid in a wattle tree. We sat under that tree looking out. Then someone said, it's gone now. It's a long way off. My father and mother were frightened too. Afraid we might get killed. So we stayed under that tree and didn't go hunting in case the plane came back. We stayed there overnight. No food. Just the bush tucker we had with us. My uncle was a stockman. He had been all the way to Wiluna. He guided us part of the way to Balgo Mission. Then we made our own way. We had no food, so we ate bush tucker along the way. We got there and met the priest. He gave us lollies. No flour. Later on, we traded bush tucker for flour and got other things. That's where we learnt about white man's ways. 
We didn't know about white people before that. We don't know white people. The Catholics were good and generous. They gave us food and lollies and things. Because we didn't know about money. They taught us little by little. Until we gradually learned English and understood it. We were baptized with holy water. No more sin. It's encounters like this one that bring to life ancient legends of white gods that introduced agriculture to various parts of the world, from places like Mesoamerica and South America, all the way across the Atlantic Ocean to the Berber tribes of North Africa by Mount Atlas, and even Sub-Saharan Africa, where Credo Mutwa, the 85-year-old Zulu shaman in South Africa, claims that this picture he had painted of tall, blonde-haired, Blue-eyed beings had been seen by black African tribes throughout that continent long before the white Europeans arrived. Credo, the official historian of the Zulu nation, said that when the Europeans first came, the black Africans thought they were the return of these same white gods, which they called Mzungu. As a result, they called the European settlers by the same name. This was very much the same reaction as the Central American people when Cortes and his Spanish invasion party arrived in 1519, and they thought that he was the returning god, Quetzalcoatl, another god described as tall, bearded, with blue eyes. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon, as well as through various other major book outlets. They make a great gift. If you'd like to support my work, you could do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description section for those that are interested. I appreciate it. Thank you. Please hit the like button and subscribe for future updates. As always, I look forward to reading your comments. So please leave me your thoughts below. Please have a wonderful weekend and I hope to see you again soon.